last of our series that we've been doing that we have called How Sweet the Sound. And what we've been doing is we've been taking the great hymns of the Christian faith. We've, let's say, contextualized them. We've looked at the stories behind them. But most importantly, we looked at the theology around them and how important that is. And so I hope that through this series, we brought a little bit of meaning and a little bit more understanding to these songs and why they're so valuable in the Christian faith. And so the next time that you sing any of the songs that we've talked about over the last, this will be fourth week, I trust that you sing them just a little bit differently because you understand just a little bit more about what they, what they mean. Over the course of these past month as we've been doing this, I believe what's been happening to me is amazing. It's been absolutely amazing over these last three weeks. God has given me such a deep sense of his presence while I'm studying and then even while I'm preaching. And I think it comes through in these songs. And today I, I am praying will be no different. I pray this will also be very deep for you. How many of you have heard the phrase, music is good for the soul? What music? When I was growing up, my dad said music was good for the soul until he heard my music, right? It was a little uh, out of his league, if you will. But yet, music is good for the soul. We know that. Music makes the, the fun times, the good times, it makes them funner, it makes them more exciting. And it makes those hard times that we go through. It just makes them more bearable, doesn't it? Music has such a power. And a good song at the right time in your life, will move you deeply, will it not? I've seen that happen time and time again. So music is good for the soul. Well, today we're going to look at a song that has that word soul in the title. Today's song is, It Is Well With My Soul. And I want to tell you, I think this message is for all of us. I just think this is for all of us. Because every single one of us, We've had to deal with some kind of loss in our life. We've had to, to deal with uh, suffering or maybe an injustice or pain or discouragement. And maybe when you've gone through that, you've even questioned, why? God, why am I in this circumstance? Why did you put me right here? God, where are you right now? Am I the only one who's felt that way? I think all of us have at some point in our life. And so there is one key verse that I want to focus on today. And I want this, I want this verse just to resonate deep. Right? I, I want you to hear it. I want it to go into your brain. And from your brain, I want it to go down through that funnel that we call a neck and get into the heart and soul. And the verse that we're going to be looking at today that we're going to use is out of the book of Psalms, chapter 34, one little verse, 18. It says this. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. He's close to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. It is well with my soul was a song that was written by a guy by the name of Horatio Spafford. Isn't that a fun name? Horatio Spafford. Horatio was a very successful lawyer in Chicago, Illinois. He was doing very, very well. He and his wife, Anna, they just, it was... Everything he touched turned to gold. You know what I mean? Anything he wanted to do was prosperous. And so as a family, it was prosperous as well because he had four daughters, and then he had a son. And he was so pumped. He, got, he finally got his son. It's what he wanted. And early in his son's life, he contracted pneumonia, and he died. I have never lost a child. And I will tell you, I cannot imagine the pain of losing a child. I cannot imagine the pain that he was in after his son died. But that's not where his losses stopped. One year after his son died, you see, he was wealthy in Chicago, and he had a lot and a lot of real estate properties. And one year after his son died, 
there was this thing called the Great Chicago Fire. Ever hear of that? He lost everything. He lost everything. Does this not sound like Job? Sounds like the book of Job. But yet, after he lost all of his financial means, his losses still weren't done. He and his wife and the daughters, they decided they, were, they needed to get away and they needed to decompress. They'd just been dealing with so much stuff. They just needed some time away. And so instead of jumping on a train and going out to California or something like that, they decided they wanted to go to Europe. And they were going to have a vacation in Europe. So they had it all planned and ready to go. And just a few days later, or a few days before he was to leave on that trip, he found out that there was something that, had, that he had to take care of at the law firm. He could not get away when he was supposed to. I hate when that happens. You ever had that? Had something planned, you're ready to go, and boom, something happened, and you can't do it. So it happened to him. So he told his wife and daughters, you go ahead. I'll take care of what i got to do here. But you go ahead. You start having fun. You go on over to Europe. You guys start having fun over there. And, and uh, I'll get everything done here that I need to, and I'll be right behind you. As a matter of fact, I'll take, it'll be two days. I'll be two days behind you. While they were sailing across the ocean, their boat was struck by another sailing vessel, and it sank, and his four daughters drowned. Anna, his wife, was floating around on some wreckage, and she was picked up by another boat that came by. She was taken to a place called Cardiff in South Wales, and there she sends a telegram to Horatio, and a part of it, it just says, saved alone. What shall I do? What shall I do? Well, Horatio had immediately packed his bags, and he was on the next boat that headed to Cardiff, and he was on his way. And on the way, the captain of the boat that he was on called him out to the bow, and he says, Horatio, this is the place where your daughter's vessel was struck, and they drowned. And so in the vicinity of where his Four girls drowned in the midst of all the pain, the pain of the loss of his son, the loss of his finances, the loss of his, three, or his four daughters. In the midst of all of that, that's where Horatio Spafford pins the lyrics to the song, It Is Well With My Soul. Wow. He writes, When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, oh, that'd be hard to say. Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. Now, I don't know, folks, but if you're anything like me, that's not what I'm writing at that point in time. Are you? I'm not writing it as well with my soul when I've just lost my, my son, and then a year later, all my finances, and, the, and then shortly that, thereafter, I, I lose all my daughters. Those aren't the words that I just would pen in the midst of pain. But that's what he did. And the truth of how that occurs with some like, someone like Horatio is a very deep, very personal, and very intimate thing. But it's found in the psalm that we just read. That the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. And he saves those who are crushed in the spirit. You know, it's very possible that some of you sitting here today Find yourself maybe in a, in a marriage that, man, it's just not what you believed it was going to be. You thought you were going to go to the distance, but the foundation is just crumbling under your feet. And you're asking the question, what shall I do? Or maybe it's the tragic loss of a loved one. Very untimely as you see it. This shouldn't have happened. It's not happened to me. And you're sitting back saying, oh, what should I do? Or maybe, maybe somebody sitting here today is... You get substance abuse. Or maybe, maybe you're addicted to pictures and images. You know, it's, it's those things that you thought only bothered everyone else, that you would never become addicted to it. But here you sit. What shall I do? That's the question. Well, what's going on? here today is that we need to understand some truths 
that are very deep within Scripture, very deep within us is where they need to be. And so the first thing we need to understand today is that even in the midst of pain, God is still present. God is still present even in the midst of pain because he's close to the brokenhearted. And he saves those who are crushed in spirit. Now, folks, I I just pray today that this truth drops down from your head into your heart. seeps. I just want to sink deep into your spirit. That the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. I love what Oswald Chambers says about that. He says, any great calamity in the natural world, death, disease, bereavement, will awaken a man when nothing else would. And is never again the same. He would never know the treasures of darkness if we were always in the place of placid serenity, security. Treasures of darkness? Is there such a thing? You know, when I first read that quote from him, I thought, that's an oxymoron. Treasure is something you get excited about and you're happy to be with. And I can't wait. You know, Ed McMahon just showed up to my house a few years ago. Anybody remember Ed McMahon coming to the house? Yeah. I wish he showed up at my house. But that's excitement. That's your that's treasure. That's what we get excited about. That's what we want to know. But you see, there is treasure in the darkness when it's pushing us into the presence of light. And that light would be God. It's only a treasure in the darkness when you begin to understand that the Lord is close. He's close to the brokenhearted and he saves those who are Christian spirit. And when that truth transcends your mind, it gets into your soul, it does become a treasure in the midst of pain. It becomes a treasure in the midst of darkness. And so when you walk through something that's dark and hard and you get into a valley and you ever been walking through some place and, and just were scared. Let's go back to a Halloween a couple weeks ago. As a kid, you remember going through some of those haunted houses? Uh, not me. I never did go into those things, but I do remember putting them on. When I was a youth minister, we had a haunted barn up in Michigan, and we did that every year. And the one thing I've noticed is anytime somebody got scared and they were with a friend, what did they do? Well, I just don't do that friend. We're hanging on together, right? I'm going to hold on to you. You hold on to me. We're safe if there's two of us. That's what we're thinking. Folks, that's the way it is with God. When we're going through something in our life that's a struggle, that's a pain, that's a heartache, we've lost a child. We've lost our finances. We lost our other children. Come on, that, that's when God's there. That's when he's closest. That's the way God is. For those of us who walk with Christ, we look look at problems, we see problems a little bit differently. Because even though sometimes we ask the question, God, where are you? Ultimately, we are turning to God. Because he's the one that's waiting on us. And no matter what I've gone through, and I, I trust this is the same with you, that when I get through this pain, this agony, or whatever it is in my life that hurts so bad, when I get through it, then I can just look up and say, Whew, God, thanks for being there. Because he promised he would never leave and he would never forsake us. He's always there. So we turn back to God. I like what it says in Psalm chapter 73, verse 28. But as for me, the nearness of God is my good. The nearness of God is my good. So when we're going through something that doesn't seem like, hey, we don't need to be doing this. God, where are you in the midst of this mess? Remember this. Just to be in the presence of God or to have God in your presence is good. Even though at times we think it's not. We need to remember that it is always good. The nearness of God is my good. Folks, That's the treasure in the darkness, the nearness of God. But for me, the nearness of God is my good. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He saves those who are Christian spirit. 
And when I look back and I survey the context of scriptures and I look at the biblical characters that I, that I find in the Bible, oh my gosh, you look and see what they did, what the hardships were, you see what they endured. Think about it. Take any number of them. Take David or Abraham or Isaac or Moses, Elijah, Peter, Paul. Folks, the list goes on and on and on, right? Those are the characters. They endured pain, but they understood the presence of God. That God was with them in the middle of their crisis, in the middle of their pain. He was there. But perhaps there was none more profound than the Son of God, Jesus. You see, Jesus, he was the sinless Son of God. He was falsely accused. He was sentenced to be flogged, and then he was crucified. He was stripped of his clothing. Lots were cast by the Roman soldiers for his garment. He was beaten within a very inch of his life. A crown of thorns was placed on his brow. And then he was made to carry a cross up the hill. That hill that was known as Golgotha, the place of the skull. And he was there put upon that cross. He was nailed to it with spikes through his hands and through his feet. And then he was lifted up. And as they lifted him up, they put a sign above his head that said, Hail, King of the Jews. People were gathered around. They looked at him and they spit on him. They mocked him. One criminal even said, hey, you saved, your, you, you saved others, save yourself and save us too. Folks, the creation was mocking the creator. That's a lot of pain. And in the midst of all that physical pain, there was also some other consequences that were going on there. That's what Brent mentioned in our communion time. The weight of the sin of all humanity was upon him. The sins of all humanity, your sins, my sins, everybody's sins were upon him. And those consequences bore on him in that moment. And we see written in the book of Matthew in chapter 27 and verse 46. I love these words, and I hate these words. You ever have that love-hate relationship? Here's a verse for that. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice. Eloah, Eloah, Lama. Sabachthani. It means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God, where are you? You ever felt like that? Did you ever just look up in the sky and say, God, where are you? I need you right now. Why aren't you here? Folks, we need to let this sink in deep into our souls. We need to listen clearly. Listen, when Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Can I tell you that there's more than one purpose to that? So many times the preachers, and I'm one of them, it stands up and says, that's when God turned his back so that Jesus could carry the sin. That's one of the purposes. But I think there's other purposes too. There was humanity, yes. There was significant pain in the physical realm, yes. But there was also some psychological pain or spiritual pain. And he was enduring all of this, right? The physical, the spiritual, the pain, the hurt. God, where are you? But even more profound is the fact that not only was he 100% man during this process, he was also 100% God through this process. And I think when we study this, that there was probably something... A, a little more profound that Jesus was saying than just, God, why do you turn your back on me? You see, Jesus was a rabbi. We know that, right? He was a teacher. He was a rabbi. Rabbis in those ancient times, what they did is they taught by saying the first line of something, and then their students would finish what they were saying. You know, it'd be like if I'd mentioned the first line of one of your favorite songs. And what do you do? Well, you can finish that song. Right? But not only do you finish the song, you have all the emotions and everything that's tied to it as well. And that's what happens here. It's happening. You see, because in Jesus' day, people spent copious amounts of time memorizing and reciting Scripture. So if a rabbi you were sitting under said a line of Scripture, then you know that everything under that you had to be able to quote back because that was the, the, the truth that the rabbi wanted. That's, that's what happened. 
And so listen, I believe that Jesus is pointing everybody who is watching his death, who is seeing this happen to him, I believe that he's put, pointing every one of those people to a prophetic and messianic psalm. Psalm 22. Open your Bibles to that if you have your Bible with you. Because we're going to look at that. You see, everybody that was there, everybody that was around the cross, when he proclaims the truth that everybody would have known that what I'm about to read to you right now would have been in their hearts and minds. Because what they know now is the fulfillment of this psalm. Jesus' words on the cross in Matthew, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You got your Bibles open? You find that in Psalm 22, verse 1. So when people heard that, they knew the Scripture that followed through that. Let me just kind of read through this with you. In verse 1, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But then it goes on, why are you so far from saving me? So far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer and by night. I find no rest. Jump down to verses 8 and 9. He trusts in the Lord that they say, let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him. Since he delights in him, Yet you brought me out of the womb, and you made me trust you, even at my mother's breast. Verse 11. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Verses 15 to 19. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of the death. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet, and all of my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them, and they cast lots for my garment. That sound familiar? Cast lots for my garments, but you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly and help me. Verse 22, I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise him. Verse 24, For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but he has listened to his cry for help. Verse 27. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. And then down to 30 and 31. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will hold Uh, will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn. He has done it. What was Jesus' words? It is finished. Do you see the similarities between these two? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Listen, this may not have been as much a question about God's presence but actually a proclamation of his goodness in the middle of a trial. In the middle of the pain. This is a treasure in the darkness. When the darkest hour of humanity was upon Jesus, the Savior of the world, when he hung up on the cross, the world watched and with bated breath as to what's going to happen. Now understand this. There was no darkness in any tomb that can contain the treasure and the power because of the resurrection. He has done it. For you, for me, he has done it. That's an amazing thing. Jesus died. He was risen from the grave so that we could have life in the middle of the pain that we're in, that know that God is present with us. If Jesus was still in the tomb, God's not with us. But because he came out of the tomb, we can know for sure that God is with us, even in the midst of our pain. Because God is still present. Because he's close. He's close to the brokenhearted. And he saves those who are crushed in spirit. I'm going to tell you what, for some of you,
what I'm about to read of the lyrics of this song. They ought to touch you. They touch me. I want you to listen to these lyrics. My sin. Oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross. I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. Can I get an amen to that? We, we don't have to worry about it anymore. It's on the cross. It went with Christ. It is finished. He did it. It is done. Folks, I want you to understand this morning, we're getting ready to sing. It is well with my soul. I want us to, to understand that this, this hymn may not be one that we've recognized over the years as one of anguish and question, but I want us to think of this hymn as one with great expectation, with great hope of what God is going to do to create a treasure in the darkness for you and me. So I want us all just to sing right now. We're going to do business with God just for a moment here. I just want to pray. And I, uh, I want you to look at the circumstances in your life. I want you to ask the question. What shall I do? And can you make the claim, it is well with my soul? Listen, the trials and tribulations in your life right now, they may not be monumental, but maybe they are. But if you're like me, it's those little things that happen every day that just keep mounting up and mounting up. They're subtle, but there's a collateral impact that takes place. The pain, the loss, the brokenness can be all-consuming. They may not feel like a treasure right now. So I want you to be bold for a moment. And I just want you to think on the things that are in your life right now that you want to be able to say, it is well with my soul.